Hello and welcome to the first edition of The Extra Point. I am Kendall Gammon and today I'm joined by Jesse Reed. Jesse, I appreciate you coming on first it's of all. It's my pleasure. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. Okay, well, uh, you've done something that many people um, decided they wanted to do back in the 80s once they saw Top Gun for the first time. <laughs> Myself but included. Yourself included. I, you, know, you know, I taught some of the things that I do, my snap principles with The Extra Point, set goals, notice strengths, accept accountability and practice persistence. Um, and then there's an overarching theme with it as well. But I just want to talk to you about what you did. Uh, tell me more about what you actually flew and, and we'll just get into it. Well, uh, like you mentioned, uh, a lot of people saw that, uh, I call, we call it the movie. <laughs> yeah. I saw that uh, back in the 80s. I saw. I remember seeing it as a kid and just thinking, uh, that's what I'm going to do someday when I grow up. I don't know how I'm going to make it happen, uh, but but that's what I'm going to do. And um, you know, really, I think all. Uh, I hesitate to call them dreams, right? You know? But when you when you have uh, something you want to do at a high level, mm -hmm. uh, it, it does. It starts with a vision, essentially. And every action, every step you take from that point where you develop that vision to the end game of here we are now, uh, in this case, flying airplanes or playing in the NFL, uh, all your actions got to sort of guide yourself towards that target. Um, and for me, it was it's, it can be as simple as inspiration, uh, seeing something like that and, and, and realizing that's what I want to do. And all my actions and, and are going to be very intentional towards making that happen someday. So in my case, yeah. and, you know, and there's a little bit of serendipity involved as well no question. in some cases. Yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, that's that's the genesis of okay. it all. Um, How about w w when you first decided you were, I mean, I think we were talking one other time. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you literally write it down or did you tell people this is what I'm going I to do? I told people, was, I was, yeah, yeah, I told people I was going to yeah. do it. And uh, more than once I got laughed out of the classroom. Right, right. I mean, I, I don't know how many times I was an elementary school kid. And we moved around a lot. I had, I came from a, a kind of a broken family growing up with mm -hmm. uh, just my mom for several years raising me and my, my little brother. Uh, and we moved around a lot, and I was always a new kid in the school, and mm -hmm. I was always immediately announcing, "Hey, by the way, I'm going to be a, a pilot someday. <laughs> I'm going to fly airplanes." And you know, I was a laughing stock, and um, that's why it's so important when you decide this is going to be what I do. I'm going to be very, very intentional about doing it. Um, it. it you know, to stand up to criticism like that, right. and to stand up to ridicule or any kind of adversity you're going to face, you got to you got to really believe it in your heart that you yeah. take the steps to make it happen. So. No, I, I get that. You know, I remember uh, the very first time I went to a Chiefs game yeah. um, in college, walking around the stadium. I wrote about it in my book, uh, Life's a Snap, and uh, the Prince song "America" was playing, and I remember. Out, lies, out loud saying to myself, I'm going to play yeah. in the NFL one day. Now, I didn't share it like you. Uh, it was my internal dream. It was uh -huh. my dream I had once I went to Pittsburgh State. So I think that's fascinating. You, you wrote it down. I, I love the fact that you weren't afraid to uh, let people know about it. Did you, um, a, a, as you moved along, and well, let's, let's go back to this first of all, is which, yeah. what, what plane did you fly specifically? Uh, I flew, I did most of my uh, career uh, flying F-18 Hornets and Super Hornets. Uh, and for the folks out there, if maybe you don't know, it's it's basically the same airplane. The Super Hornet was a new variant, a, a slightly newer variant that came out in the late 90s that was a little bit bigger and had some more capability. But for the most part, uh, you know, somebody at home looking at both of them side by side, they're kind of hard to tell the difference right. without a trained eye. So. You know, it's, 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 it's funny. We, we, we look at it. Um, you flew uh, supersonic <clears throat> jets for a living. I threw a ball between my legs for a living. <laughs> Not the most cerebral of things to do. Uh, but, but but it was one thing, and, you know, I joke about sometimes that, um, you know, at one point in time in the NFL, I was considered one of the best long snappers in the league. So I was arguably the best at my craft uh -huh. uh, in the world. And, and um, the fact is, for me, though, uh, in my craft, and I joke about it, but you know, it, it was a, it was my goal. Yeah. I joke about it, but there was never that chance of, quite honestly, of losing my life. I mean, maybe get hurt, but uh, we talk about battles in the football mm -hmm. field, but that's just a, you know, that's just a metaphor. Yeah. For you, you were truly in the battle. True, truly in battles, yes. And um, but I like the parallel. And uh, now I, I played high school football. Right. Never made it to, to another level. I really enjoyed that. But I think what I, what drew me to the military and what still draws me to football and why I love it so much today are the parallels between uh, the two yep. different, um, they call them like lifestyles, uh, two different. Yeah, no, that's, I, I think mean, that's right. To me, uh, you know, on the football field, you, you know, you've got uh, the troops going to battle, following mm -hmm. the general in the battle, uh, right. so to speak. 
And um, though the, I think playing football early on and facing adversity in sports in general and all that is 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 at least in the, as far as the military goes is a, is a great parallel to prepare you for that to prepare for failure for heartache. Uh, don't get me wrong, I, I you know being an F eighteen pilot was great, and I also got to some pretty high levels that I'm I'm very thankful to have done it. But it didn't come without a lot of failure and a lot of screw ups along the way. Right, and uh, you know some of those hurt worse than others. Um, but yeah, even the parallel, like you said, of, of personal safety, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot on the line mm -hmm. for, uh, whether you're snapping the ball or, uh, you're going out into combat, there's the, the guys that you're playing that's with, gonna the be the first, that's going to be the first and last time we compare snapping the ball <laughs> to going out into combat. I promise you that I, I was not thinking that, but, uh, no, but I get it. I mean, it is amazing to me though, because Okay, you know, we, we went from when you, you thought you were going to do it, and we'll probably jump all around, but yeah. now you're in the cockpit, and you're in sorties yeah. over, I don't know, Afghanistan, Iraq, yeah. wherever mm -hmm. it may be. I mean, you're doing it for real, which is what you train to do. I, yes. I would assume, uh, just like me getting ready, not just like me, but in a sense, you know, getting ready for a game, you train, you train, you train, yeah. and when it's finally, t your time is called, you're like, okay, let's go. This is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, exactly, and... Um, Probably again the, using the, the the parallel of of comparing the two with football and, and flying, you know, there's the big picture. Right. You always want to go out and win the game. You want to win the Super Bowl. You want to win whatever. Uh, but at the micro level, in the moment, when you're snapping the ball or I'm asked to drop a bomb somewhere, uh, you don't want to let those guys down. That's right. the big picture is the big war or the battle or whatever is going on. But at the micro level, this guy depends on me. Uh, the guy next to me on the line, the guy down on the ground, depends on me, and I need to do my job to take care of him. And again, that it's uh, uh, I have no shortage of parallels right. between the two. I'm sure that's why I think it's that's why uh, you know um, I think this is such an appropriate conversation. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. You and I met at training camp uh, yeah. this last year, and they were talking about some things, and yeah. I just happened to mention uh, during my playing days and getting ready. You know how big uh, visualization was for me yep. when I got ready for uh, for the uh, the combine way back in wow 1992 yep. and and did it my whole life and and how I I, I mean I took in excess of a hundred thousand snaps during my career for mm -hmm. 15 years physically yep. uh, but I bet I took 10 times that mentally and the visualization side of things and you came up and talked to me about that afterwards and that's something that you guys really uh, as pilots deal with also right it absolutely is there's there's um there's forms of rehearsal where mm -hmm. you're actually doing stuff. So we call it chair flying. Right. So, uh, you know, if I was going to go out and do a big mission tomorrow or in a few days, I would rehearse uh, all the steps uh, sitting here in my chair at 1G, as we say, where there's not all the other yeah. external stress. You I'm, go really you <laughs> I'm really good at 1G. I'm really good at 1G. Well, yeah. So you got you got to be good at it at 1G before you can be good at it in seven and a half Gs. So, wow. Uh, but, you know, even when I was just learning how to fly, the very first steps, you know, new guy uh, coming out of college in flight school, um, you got to know where all the switches are. Right. And you got to be able to reach for them without looking uh, under pressure. So uh, we close our eyes and I would practice this switch and that switch. And this is the fire control handle and this is a fuel shutoff valve and all those kinds of things that you need to know in the heat of the moment. Let's say the cockpit got filled up with smoke and fumes and it's nighttime and you had a full electrical failure, whatever. You got to be able to find that stuff. Uh, off of instinct, we call right. it brainstem power. Okay. So when all us the conscious stuff starts failing, um, and starts, unconscious competence. Uh, exactly. That's what I tried exactly. to get with yep. the, the NFL. The minute I got out there, no matter what was going on, I, I hoped that I'd done it so many yep. times so that, that it just came. It happened. And you know, Morton Anderson one time wasn't. He's a Hall of Fame kicker. Yep. Yeah. He was here for with the Chiefs for a, a couple of years. I remember a game or two where he wasn't kicking well uh, to begin the, or in in the pregame. Yeah. And he was like, Ken, he comes up and he goes, Kendall, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. I mean, I'm not hitting him right or anything. I was like, dude, you've been playing for 18 years. <laughs> when you get out, you just keep going and just keep working on it. And when you get out there, your body's going to take over. Yep. Sounds to me that's kind of what you're talking that's exactly about. exactly it. And we call it we call it brain stem power. Nice. That's the, the affectionate Navy term for it. That, that works for me. Uh, but yeah, when all else fails, um, don't overthink it. And right. you've done the reps a million times. You've done the muscle memory. You've you've done it with your eyes closed. You've chair flown it, as we say. Uh, and let let what is ingrained now in your brain as muscle memory take over. And a lot of times that's a good way to operate. Yeah, uh, for sure. Because we can psych ourselves out with conscious thought. That's where all the practice and all the stuff that you, uh, you know, we see all the glamorous stuff. We see the games. 
uh, you see the movies, whatever. Um, but it's all the work that gets put in that's 99% of your time spent right. in your craft <clears throat> that people don't see. That's really where you're making your money. It's yeah. not... Your right, performance it, is yeah is the result. So. Yeah, you, yeah, your performance has really started weeks, years, <laughs> weeks, months, years ago. Because yeah. ultimately, you can't get there. You know, you talked about being accountable. I, I, I love that, and the fact of, you know, when they're you know, when you're up there with your wingman. That's the only way I know to say it. I know yeah. that's silly, but I, I guess that's what it is. I mean, you're accountable to each other, or you know, I, I don't know when you flew. Was the the uh, the the jet you flew? Mm -hmm. Did you have somebody behind you, or was it just you? Uh, so I flew a couple variants of the F-18. Uh, some of them were single seat with just a pilot, and then some of them had what we call a WIZO. Wep it's a weapon system operator okay. uh, sitting in the back seat. Um, and depending on what squadron you went to, you could either have a one seat crew or a two seat crew. The two seat crews have a couple extra missions that they do. Um, but yeah, I had the experience of flying with uh, just in the cockpit by myself or with another crew member, but one thing that never changes, at least in the fighter pilot community, is you're always flying with another airplane out there. So whether you're in the okay. seat by yourself, so I was correct you have about a you always have, or you're a So you always have somebody to be accountable to. Exactly. That you probably have a fairly decent relationship with, have been around? Yes, or? yes, but you may not also. You may, you may yeah. not even know. Sometimes you, uh, you show up in combat or in a mission and you just know somebody by their voice over the radio and that's about well, it. <laughs> and I, I would think that would maybe be even more uh, important to understand that you you mm -hmm. you trust that they were trained just like you were, and that they're going to give yes. their all just like you. you yes, do. and that, and at least uh, again, and I'm speaking in military terms, and other right. sure no, that's fine. But we call it standardization. So I know, uh, no matter who I meet up with in country overhead, I know if this guy was trained in the U.S. military and the Navy or the Air Force, we can speak a certain language and okay. without me having met him and I, uh, him or her, and uh, I know we're going to be able to communicate effectively. How about as far as, uh, you know, it, it was glamorized in Top Gun, sure. and, and then you get up there, and Top Gun is, is, a, is a movie for the ages, in fact, yeah. they're making a second one, I know That's we right. can talk about that here in, in a little, little next bit. next summer. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. He, he, he's getting paid for that, folks. He's going to get paid for that, I'm sure. But um, how many times did you experience people like, man, that just must be awesome, and they just think it's great, and they don't understand it? Because I know for me, people be like, oh, man, you, you're a long snapper. That, that, that's the best job in the world. Uh, they, they don't understand that yeah. my head's down, that I'm yeah. getting the crap knocked out of me, and that there's pressure, that I, I hold the fate of the team in my, in my hands each and every time. How did you deal with that? I mean... Uh, well, did it bother you, or did you just understand? Sometimes people, if they don't know, they just don't know. You understand, because, I mean, uh, you know, um, I, I happen to be blessed. We happen to be blessed with, with we had careers where you're, you're, to a certain extent, you're a role model to people. Right. And people get excited about and enthusiastic about what you do, and I am absolutely grateful for that. Um, but people also, there's a great video that was just out um, a few weeks ago. I think it was Drew Brees. Okay. Preparing for one of his games, and he was in the training complex oh, yeah. all by himself. Uh, and I think it was Reggie Bush was filming him, and he goes, "Hey, this is what it takes to be great." Uh, Drew Brees had no idea he was being filmed, 100 yards away in the training complex, and he's just going through his reads, and he's he's looking around, and he's just chair flying stuff basically right. by right. himself. You, uh huh. And uh, the thing that uh, folks who get excited about this and they're kind of like fans or enthusiastic or, or very interested in what you do don't realize that that's, again, the 99% of your time spent is right. that part of it. Uh, I was lucky enough to go through Top Gun uh, as well um, back in 2009. And I can tell you as cool as the movies are and as inspiring as they are, they don't scratch the surface on what it actually takes right. to get through that program, which is a lot of study. I mean, you know, you're... A day for a flight there is is uh, several hours of preparation just to give you a brief for the flight. Two hours, an hour and a half to two hours of, of actually giving your brief and getting ready in the pre-flight. Oh, then wow. you go out and you just fly for an hour, and then you come back and you debrief for another four or five hours. So I mean, it's yeah. probably a lot of is parallels it, again with football. You stuff say debrief. Is that the AAR after action report, or do you call them that? We go in and, and it's just called debriefing. We, yeah, we go in and we talk. It's, it's the equivalent of us watching film after it's game exactly day, right? It's exactly the same. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> this is, again, another great parallel. So, you know, you come back, you determine whether you succeeded in your mission for the day or not. Right. Uh, you know, if, if it's a, and a lot of times it's just training missions for us. But we come back in. Did we get mission success? Yes or no? Uh-huh. 
Uh, and then we talk about, okay, well, let's see what it took to get there. When right. Let's see what went wrong. Even if things went right, let's see what we did wrong and could get better at. Right. And then, yeah, we just get into the tapes. We have tapes of all our radar displays and our heads up displays and all that. And we just go literally minute by minute through that flight and we go, okay, right here. Okay. What do we do? What are we thinking here? Uh, yeah, I should have done this. Should have done that. Okay. We're our, we're our own worst critics. <laughs> of yeah, course, I'm sure. Which yeah. I think you have to be. Um, the, the talk of you were inverted and, and that, 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 doesn't, that, that may just be a little bit of movie yeah, magic. Yeah, no, right? no middle fingers upside down. So, but um, oh, that's amazing. But yeah, a lot of people don't realize the uh, the amount of like non glamorous work, if right. you will, that goes. Into I know it. For, for football, it was about we thought it was about four hours of meetings to every hour, or out meetings <laughs> or film to every hour that you were on the field. Yeah, and, and yours is probably even more so with that. How about um, you know for me since you know I played fifteen years, very fortunate. Fortunate. Um, and then you know, I, I get asked, and I, and I do teach uh, people how to long snap, some, some high school kids, some college kids even. Uh, you, you taught at the highest level as well, right? Top yeah. Gun? Yeah, so when you go through as Top Gun uh, through the course, the, the, whole, the whole purpose of that program is, is and really, um, it was sort of the first center of excellence that ever existed. That, they, they were really the, the ones back in the 60s that coined the phrase center of excellence, which is now mimicked in corporate America and all that stuff, uh -huh. where they decided we're going to get a bunch of folks that are just going to work at excelling, being the best, and, and basically creating expertise in a certain uh, field, in this case, aviation and being a fighter pilot. And then we're going to get so good at it, we're going to figure out the best practices the, uh, and techniques to use, and then we're going to teach them to everyone else. We're not mm -hmm. going to hold on to the secret. We're going to get really good at it uh, through every tool we have, whether it's study of the adversary uh, and just our own training reps and techniques. And then uh, we're going to go sort of uh, instill that to the rest of the fleet. Right. Uh, we call the fleet basically the rest of the, the Navy. Okay. So that Joe Schmo coming out of flight school can execute this and go out and be effective and you know win the game so to speak so um and uh so yeah so as a so as a top Gun graduate it doesn't end there you don't just go hey high five we we finished yeah. this course right uh, now, you now it's your have job a, to take a responsibility it out. Okay. to go take it and, but not uh, everybody go. Not every. I mean, not everybody gets no, into Top Gun. No, right? no, no, I mean, no. It's, it's pretty selective. It's very correct? competitive. It's very competitive. Thus, the name Top Gun. I yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's very competitive. Um, you know, there's a handful of folks a year out of uh, which is already a very competitive community. Right. Flying, exactly. Flying uh, any kind of tactical aircraft. Uh, it, it took a lot of work and and uh, serendipity and skill to get to that point, and then from there somehow again timing and desire and right. and work ethic and all that gets you to that next phase and really uh we like to say you know once you get the uh once you get the uh, top gun patch on your shoulder you kind of lose the right to be stupid anymore is what we say interesting um, huh, I'm still, yeah yeah you see i don't have that so but part of being stu still stupid part of not being stupid is and we're not perfect we don't yeah. have a zero defect right uh, you know uh fighter pilots or uh you know top gun graduates we're not a zero defect group of people um, part of your credibility of not being stupid, so to speak, is uh, is admitting, being the first to admit, hey, I could have done this better. And right. people look at that and they, they, they glom onto that. Too many people, I think, and nowadays are afraid to admit failure, admit when they could have done something better. And I actually, and I speak, I think, again, for, you know, folks that I've worked with over the years, uh, that, that is, that's a... Um, that's a characteristic of leadership to us. Yeah. It, well, that's, that's be, really, it's, yeah. it's accountability. It, it's, exactly. it's understanding that you take, you own your actions, good or bad, and, mm -hmm. and ultimately you don't fail. You just, you weren't successful that time and, and you, you're going to have to go back. The only time, in my mind, the only time you fail is when you quit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, because you don't get better without failing. In my, right. You know, somebody, I used to, I used to have the privilege of, of leading uh, a couple hundred sailors uh, in a squadron. So, you know, as a pilot, you're, you've got your main part of your job where you fly airplanes and you, you, you try to uh, um, train to go to battle. Right. And then you go to battle. But then when you're not flying, you also have other duties that you have to do. And, and at least uh, for naval officers, we, we have folks that we're in charge of in the squadron. And for me, I was in charge of maintenance folks that worked on the jets. Oh. So you get very close and personal to the... Uh, to the uh, the men and women that are actually fixing your jets and making them fly, and um, I always told them, I said, hey, I don't want, uh, uh, you know, this isn't a zero defect environment here. I, I want you guys to make healthy mistakes, uh, 
right. and learn from them. Uh, I, the most dangerous guy on a team, I think, is somebody that's never experienced failure because when it finally does happen at a critical moment, how are they going to know how to handle themselves? Right, so, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we've talked a little bit about set goals and the note of strengths because you you have to, <laughs> to figure out what you're good at and you, you figured that early on and we even just talked about accountability. I want to go into persistence a little bit because, okay. you know, for me, you know, snapping a ball between your legs, a lot of persistence there. You talked a little bit about it in terms of uh, what you called chair flying yeah. or, or 1G, but I mean, how, how many hours do you figure you had in a plane before you were really ready to, to go out and, and do it? Because I, um, I think it might be staggering for people to hear. Yeah, so, I, and I, I had a private <clears throat> license on my own before I started flying for the Navy. Okay. Uh, so I had, you know, 100 hours or so, which really isn't that much still, but uh, it took two and a half years of flight school flying almost every day until uh, I got winged. So, wow. I mean, that two and a half years from when I graduated college was flying every day, and you start with the basics of just, you know, pull back on the stick, trees get smaller, <laughs> wow. push forward, trees get bigger, basic <laughs> flying concepts, right. to, uh, to formation, to then advanced tactics, dogfighting, that kind of stuff. And then for us in the Navy is landing on the ship, which in itself is right. hundreds and hundreds of hours of just repetition because... That for sure is one of those things that you absolutely require brainstem power to do, or you can't do it because there's no doubt the first couple times you do it. And for me, every time I did it at night, I was on brainstem power because it's it's uh, it's terrifying. At well, times. I mean, it's really amazing too. The fact of, I mean, it's it physically it's taxing, and also isn't it because you hook on, so you have to, <laughs> don't you? I'm I'm going off what I've heard, but yeah. you have you have to. I'll just say floor it. Right when you sit down, so in case you miss the line, you're ready to go back off. Is that, am I correct? Or is, uh, yeah, is that... yeah, that's absolutely correct. And I think we well, there's probably some footage of it or something when you get there. But yeah, when you land on the ship, you know it's a landing strip that's only a couple hundred feet long. So when you land, you don't have enough distance to stop. They got the the arresting wires that are they're storing out across the deck. Okay. And you have a tail hook, which is a thing that swings down on the tail end of the airplane. It catches on to one of those wires when you land. Sometimes it catches, sometimes it doesn't. You have to be prepared for the the worst case, which is it doesn't catch. So as soon as you land, you go full power. If you feel yourself hit a brick wall, basically, and come to a stop, okay, the, 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 the wire caught. Can... Wow. If you uh, you go full power and you just keep flying and go off the other end of the air, the ship, you go, well, I guess we didn't catch it this time. <laughs> Let's try it again. So that, that's amazing. But uh, at you know daytime, not so bad. You can see things. Uh, you have uh, a lot of visual cues uh -huh. at night, black night with no moon, or maybe there's an overcast that's covering the moon and the stars and all the other ambient light, and you're just landing on a little, it looks like a little postage stamp of lights in the middle of a black ocean. And then if you go off the end again, no visual reference whatsoever, you're trusting your instruments, and again, you're on you know, brainstem power. You're doing what you've trained to do at that point, and you're trusting you're trusting your training and uh, working off muscle memory there. So that is amazing. Um, you know, I thought it was a thrill to do what I did, but to me, that's you know, ten times above this. <laughs> I only talking to each other. You think what I did was kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of thrilling, but so we'll agree to disagree. But I think if we <laughs> ask most people, it's going to be yours. Um, Everything you've done, um, there always had to be something inside you that was pushing you. I mean, um, to, to make you at a young age uh, want to do what you did, this is you know, what we'll end on, which is, you know, to me, is what is your extra point? I mean, what is it that, that's pushed you to be successful uh, or pushed you to get by things when you weren't so successful? Because obviously that happened as well. I think a lot of it was my inspiration as a kid. So I, so I had this dream uh, of, of flying airplanes, but... Um, you know, at that point, as a little kid, you don't really quite understand how to make things happen yet. But I watched my mom at a young age. Uh, my brother had leukemia when we were kids, so I have a single mom raising two kids. Uh, one of them has cancer and working multiple jobs. And I saw that persistence and that grit that she put in every day. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you know, as I got older, I realized, wow, that's not insignificant what she did, the, right. the amount that she took on her shoulders. And it was almost um, sort of like a sense of personal pride of like, I've got to live up to this family legacy of hard work and grit. So I have this thing I want to do. I realize it's going to take that. I don't have any choice in my own mind except to put in everything I have to it. Uh, it was further refined when my mom got remarried uh, to who I consider my dad. He's mm -hmm. been for years and years now. Um, and he was also a pilot and an engineer and very inspiring and sort of helped me cultivate 
more of the uh, the strategic long view of how to make things happen. So my mom, inspiration for like the hard work and the grit and the determination. And then my dad came in and said, hey, this isn't just a dream that you talk about. Let's right. talk about how we actually make this happen. And um, the, you know, the, the, the different, the very specific roles that both my role models, my mom and dad played in my life right. uh, were, were essential, I think, to getting to, I, I, I honestly don't think I would be sitting here today like the, uh, with, with all these stories to tell and experiences if uh, I didn't have those two people in my life to help focus me, so. Yeah, it sounds like um, there was one that inspired you and the other one that helped you sit down with your father and, and make the plans. And I, I mean, I think that's a, you know, a great metaphor for, you know, whatever we want in life. I mean, certainly when anybody can want something sure. but until you figure out a way of how you're going to go after it and have that absolute, uh, that absolute uh, drive and want yeah. to, to go do it, I think uh, is, is something that, uh, is lacking sometimes, yeah. but uh, and sometimes we, we need help. I mean, I appreciate you coming on here. You know, you inspire me, and we've talked about this. This is fun. We've become good friends, and uh, I, I love that extra point. So I appreciate you coming yeah. on, and we'll thank you very much. Yeah, no, it's you, an honor to be here. You were the first, the inaugural of <laughs> the extra point, and uh, with that, I want to say thank you for listening, thank you for watching, and uh, we'll be back with more. Take care.